Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Secret to Success episode twelve. Uh, and today I have with me Grandmaster uh, P Magesh Chandran. And uh, welcome, sir. <coughs> welcome to the show. And uh, today it's going to be very exciting. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to learn a lot, and also the viewers will be able to learn a lot. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here, Karthik. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yeah and uh, i always start with like how people start chess and so on so i read somewhere that you start chess accidentally is it true or uh, like uh, how did you start yeah chess? i did start accidentally but i think that is kind of uh, <laughs> probably true for most people yeah i i learned chess because um, i mean my actually my dad tells the story really nicely my dad and my mom they played cards when when i was very young and then my mom used to be really good at i mean she was doing they were playing for money and my mom used to make a lot of money beating my dad <laughs> so he wanted to get some get some money back and he was better at chess <laughs> so <laughs> that's how i was introduced to chess so i started seeing them play and then it's my brother um who was actually playing a little bit more seriously he had taken some training and he was playing a little bit i mean no formal training but at least a little bit and um so him and his friends were teaching me the basics and the very first tournament i played i did very well luckily i if i remember right i was i kind of scholars checkmated everyone <laughs> so <laughs> it was the madurai district championship and i was 8 uh, years old and i went in every game i would finish in like 5 6 moves i would try to do the scholars made and it would work so i thought i was a genius <laughs> when i came out of that <laughs> yeah an accidental path yeah and then how did you like uh, when did you start taking uh, when did you start taking chess seriously and uh, how did you progress uh, after the beginning you know after learning the moves and so on um the the first tournament was of course a big break for me right so because i did well in the first tournament i think i i started thinking that like i said like this false kind of belief in some sense that i was just too good <laughs> and my 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 dad also got exposed to it after that because uh, right after that uh, there was a coach in uh, madurai his name is nagarajan he's he's no more uh, but he approached my dad and like in the very next tournament or something talked to him said okay your kid is doing good and my dad started kind of realizing that and he just said okay you know why don't you take some training with with this coach and from then on it's just uh, the coach's guidelines and you know it was again th- they say that you know it's to be real lucky right you be at the right place at the right time <laughs> so that's essentially what happened i mean like if i hadn't won like the tournament very quickly i might not have felt like chess is that big uh, my dad might not have invested more time and money into it and also um, the very first 6 months was very good for me i mean there were phases in which i stagnated but the first 6 months i progressed really fast i learned i basically you know, came in i don't know second or third in the state championship and i came in like uh third in the national championship in like the first few months so then it was very obvious that okay maybe i can do something with chess so then um yeah then with my coach we started spending a lot of time i mean it's i think credit to <laughs> my coach for pushing me a lot he used to literally come and live in our house <laughs> so to get me to play good chess <laughs> so it's not actually quite easy to win tournaments very early on so what was the kind of work you were doing um, like that uh, got you immediate results yeah that's um, i mean once i started getting the training i can tell you probably more about what was happening before that of course it's like i said purely luck i um, mean if my if my opponents didn't didn't knew how to stop scholars mate i might not have had such tremendous success but after that what happened was uh, my coach is very very structured so nagarajan sir was extremely structured for that time he used to have notebooks and notebooks and notebooks for us where you know it'd be like openings written down in sheets so you would make charts in fact within those notebooks there'll be diagrams of chess positions so we can actually visualize it so he put in a lot of effort for us to sit and actually study it was the most boring thing for me to sit and study openings at that time and even today <laughs> but when i started uh, going through those things he made my life so easy by creating those things and um, i mean it's mostly the environment i think like m- most people should hopefully agree with this the fact that there are lots of talented people a lot of people who are ready to work hard not everybody gets to um, gets to achieve whatever they want to achieve right so i i would say that the environment was great i was able to spend like 7 8 hours of chess um, in a in a way that you know in, in, i was very young at that time there was there are times i was feeling a little bored and stuff but still there were people around me to push me in that direction 
but after a point once you win some stuff then that starts driving you a little bit more then you know you want to win right you're like oh i want to win the trophy i want to come in first so those things drove me more as as i went but initially the environment i would say played the biggest part for me to you know get started and go in the right direction and maybe uh, eventually end up becoming gm yeah yeah and for people who are just starting right now like what should they start with like i know that like capo blanca said that people should start studying by you know studying end games or something so what is your general recommendation to those uh, i mean beginners or uh, chess players who are just I- starting Absolutely, I think I would very much go with that school <laughs> school of thought. I have been teaching chess now for several years now. Actually, I would say my main profession is actually a chess teacher. I um, so when I started teaching, that's what I would literally do. I would just teach king and pawn games because my understanding was uh, that it's very very difficult to teach other concepts for kids who don't know how to play with one piece yet, right? How to checkmate with the queen, how to have one, like a king and pawn game. If they are not able to calculate that. there is this is really a bad idea to teach them much more complex things so i i totally agree with that um but now i kind of find a balance because i i would say initially i was very much towards that end i would teach probably like 80 90% of end games and then at some point i realized that uh, they're not even getting those end games ever in their game <laughs> so eventually i i kind of found some balance okay we teach basic opening strategies and other things but If you want to be really good at chess, I I totally would go with that. I would say start with end games because end games are clear. End games you can calculate. End games you can conclude. Chess as it is very very um, I mean as you get to middle game and opening it's very confusing, <laughs> right? I mean everyone can have a different opinion. There are different ideas. There's a lot of amb- ambiguity. So end games will clear it out of the way and help you be. study the basic things very very clearly so you should definitely do that if you are serious about chess yeah yeah and before moving forward there are a couple of audience questions usually my audience is uh, they're quite shy and they don't ask many questions <laughs> so first of all uh, this question is from chess master is saying is 14 and is around 1500 rated and he's asking is it possible for him to become uh, a grand master by the age of uh, 20 if he works hard absolutely why not yeah i mean i am very i'm i'm generally an optimist in some sense <laughs> and uh, i don't see a reason why you cannot achieve something if you are really willing to put in the work the last part was the most critical part right work hard yeah. so you can do things provided you understand how much um is a work requirement and you're able to fill that in so that's the only uh, thing that i usually tell my students where i also notice that there's a gap uh, i think most people i have other things figured out but what they don't sit down and think about it's okay if i have to achieve this by this time how many hours of chess am i seriously going to put in right if you can if they can understand that and really put that in then absolutely possible in fact i don't think anyone um you know is not cannot achieve that achieve that i mean even if you're let's say 40 and you want to play chess the question is can you put those hours the problem is the as you get older you get lot more um you know I can say distractions, but also responsibilities and lots of other things that take you away from chess. And that's why when you're eight years old, you can spend a lot more time on chess compared to fourteen, where you're studying for exams and board exams and other things. So there are going to be some restrictions. But if you are really willing to spend time, you're really really willing to sacrifice some things and put the effort into chess. Uh, definitely six years uh, for that. Yeah, it's just that you have to spend a lot of time studying and be very focused. you should be willing to sacrifice you know other other worldly pleasures <laughs> you might your friends might be playing outside or hanging out and going places if you're willing to sacrifice some of those things definitely you can yeah achieve it so in your own life like how much uh, like hard work uh, did you do when you were young uh, uh, let's say let's uh, can you tell me in a number like how many hours do you used to work in a day and so on Sure. When I was younger, yeah, I was working very hard. Um, so let's say uh, maybe between the age of, I, I would say between the age of like ten to like fourteen, probably was my was my peak amount of work. I I don't know, roughly seven eight hours a day. I would say was probably happening um, because my school was very uh, helpful. I studied in a school named Dolphin Public School in Madurai, and they were very helpful. They would not require me to come to. 
actual classes uh, they would help me with the tests and i mean like help me in the sense like have uh, teachers come in and teach me and guide me for those tests and stuff so i had the flexibility to not go to school at all so my coach would come in and literally we would go to we had a place next door um where we could use just for the chess uh, training and we would spend the whole day so i i would think that somewhere like 7 8 hours easily was happening there between the playing and studying and like basically doing chess there was some probably more intense work some less intense work but overall that much and i remember also in when i was in my 10th grade i was uh, extremely uh, pushed for time but i also spent a lot of time in chess during those time um by yeah literally I, i i didn't do anything else in life right i mean i would finish school i would come back i would spend like four five hours in the evening just studying chess and then i would get up at four o'clock in the morning the next day to do whatever school work was required i wish i have that kind of discipline all the time <laughs> but uh, that i mean it definitely you can i mean i can tell that that definitely helped the most for me i was able to get to a certain point and do do things because of that and uh, niranjan album is saying that he really liked your video who is an expert we, uh, like who is an expert video and uh, he's saying that and also oh yeah yeah, yeah. sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's a video i made about i mean i'd like to make some youtube videos on and off i, I think when the pandemic started i was more inclined to it i was like su- doing like more frequently uh, but yeah and then it, the thing went down so i i put this out video recently thank you thank you niranjan it's uh, it's it's one of my ideas to to share with the world to see how people should understand when an expert gives an opinion <laughs> yeah and do you think it's a coincidence that uh, grandmaster deepan chakravarty and grandmaster aravind chidambaram also studied in uh, dolphin public school or it's not a coincidence a special power to that school as well well it, it's the school's efforts i mean i will not say it's a coincidence at all because they spent um time actually encouraging just players So when I studied um I was the first but in fact if I remember right the Dolphin school has like five Asian champions this was um a while ago I they might even have more <laughs> I don't know but the reason why they are particularly there was a phase when they did so much is that so w- when I was playing the school would literally organize the state championship because someone one of their students was doing really well and this is almost unheard of in most <laughs> most places right yeah. so they went out of their way to encourage the chess uh, scene there so their correspondent uh, at that time was ramanathan and he was helping a lot there were some chess coaches the nalingam sir who also was my coach later on was involved in that there lots of people there but um, they really got involved in chess there is no way to bring that kind of a chess culture right you now bring like multiple grandmasters asian champions all by pure luck right so yeah it's, i i might be happy to say that i might have started the trend i don't know if that happens anymore unfortunately maybe now it is toned down a little bit but after that um after i left madurai i just saw that there was still a boom a lot of players playing in and coming from the same school and becoming a grandmaster i think particularly from a small town from a small school i i am very proud of what, <laughs> what they did very happy for that yeah and also yeah i was uh, training under uh, mr uh, gaus kamaruddin uh, oh yeah yeah his house was right next to dolphin school and uh, do you have any memories with him like very training under him and uh, can you share yes anything? yes i have um, so i had the main coaches i had was nagarajan sir and then after that it was rangarajan sir and tinali sir they were the two main coaches after that but i worked with so many of them in madurai like you said gaus kamaruddin um, i had played games with him I, you know you would analyze games with me so um, i'm trying to remember some of the other names um, atulan sir i played and trained with him uh, he was very useful and uh, there are more people unfortunately i feel bad that i not everyone's coming to my mind right now but uh, i i generally yeah i would say that the environment that i spoke about early on was extremely extremely um, important that's the reason why i was able to succeed uh, there was in fact a chess library my dad uh, who was the biggest <laughs> supporter for what all uh, of the things that i did set up a chess library in my house so he we had a chess library you used to buy books so to build the chess culture he ended up doing that so we had a lot of people come in study chess and then when they come to study chess they'll play with me they will analyze the games with me and stuff like that so it was uh, yeah very very nice uh, environment that was created so i didn't really feel like work most of the time 
Yeah, and uh, you said like you used to work for seven to eight hours. Like uh, one of the main questions is like what to work on is uh, like one of the hardest questions to answer. Like and uh, since you were working for seven to eight hours, what were you focusing on particularly? Okay, so that's like you said the hardest question. Yeah, <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. What do we work on in terms of chess is uh, is very difficult. So lucky for me, I had a guide. um i would recommend that for everyone you need a coach who tells you what to do right at particularly at the younger age once you get to a certain level um i don't know what i can say as a maturity in terms of age or rating i don't know in terms of rating maybe a 2000 or 2200 um in terms of maturity maybe you know 13 or 14 maybe teenage um i could say where you can start driving things on your own a little bit and it still needs a lot of support but at a younger age you just generally need someone to guide you to tell you what are the things to work on right because there's plenty and i think of this as just like generally training anything right if you go to a gym for uh, you know fitness you're not just going to work on you know one part of your body all the time right it's just going to not yield the right kind of results and that's what chess is also right it's like or or any other sport for the matter of fact yeah you go to train in tennis if you just keep on training for forehand or volley or something like that it's not going to help you in an overall game someone might just completely crush you because you have a glaring weakness somewhere else so uh, overall you have to work on everything but having said that there is a huge um weighted kind of uh, area where i feel like maybe i don't know un- until 800 1800 or so you could gain a lot by doing a lot of tactics Yeah. So you could if you disproportionately work in tactics and let's say openings alone until 1800 I feel like you might gain um more speed so you could so the way I think of this is that throughout your chess career you should be balancing things out but there are certain stages where one area of the game can probably consume more time from you and that's okay and that's where I'm saying you need a guide right if a coach should tell you Okay, I want you. So at this point, I want you to do a lot of tactics. I want you to play a lot of games. That's going to get you really moving, right? And then, but if you don't work on your middle game or end game, so you'll reach an eighteen hundred, and you'll you're going to hit a plateau, right? Yeah. At that point, your gap in your uh, strength on tactics and your gap in your end game, you might be playing like an eighteen hundred in tactics, play like a thousand in <laughs> in in your end game or middle game. So then you're that's where the plateau happens, yeah. now people say oh you know what now i'm not able to improve i'm working and i'm working and i'm working because suddenly there are some areas that you have not spent time at all and you need to do a lot of catching up right and that's the the spread so overall i think um, yeah to to kind of sum it up i would say you do need a guide to tell you what is required and what is a good place to work on and um, i mean i had that luckily throughout my chess career and that's very important Yeah, and for some people in uh, India, like uh, they cannot afford uh, coaches or uh, coaches, especially nowadays. Okay, the coaching, uh, the cost of coaching has increased, and like people are cha- charging like on average, they are charging around thousand per hour. So many people cannot afford a guide. So what would you recommend for those players? Yeah, that is true. I've noticed the trend. I mean, I'm in the chess teaching business too. I make a living out of teaching too, so I'm, I'm familiar with this uh, with this thing. Yeah, the costs have gone up. So um, I do think that's uh, plenty of free features available outside. Like for example, um, the pandemic has brought one new trend that is where you get to. So this interview, for example, something like what we are talking right now, where people get to actually see the process of how these players. achieve what they achieved yeah, to become a grandmaster or something like that which was not so uh, obvious before i mean you, but now i think you I mean your channel has a bunch of other gms who are talking about it, which is fantastic i could look at it and i could find these questions like you said when did these players start playing chess how many hours did they work on <laughs> right and uh, so these kind of this kind of information is very nice and available right now it it had uh, you know it was not there before so i think that's that's a huge help but in general like chess.com or the youtube channels i think there's plenty of uh information available out there so if you unfortunately if you're not able to afford a coach i would still say uh if you spend sheer amount of time studying chess it cannot be bad if you're watching videos the only thing i would say is you know watching like videos and things that are actually uh, curated and make sure it's good content right you want to know if a grandmaster is streaming they know it's good <laughs> so 
something like that. They want to make sure it's uh, if chess.com is putting out a video, it's good. You know, chess kid is putting video, it's good. And you now India has a great booming chess scene. All the top grandmasters are streaming, which is good. So I would say that um, plenty of free content available. Hopefully, you can still make use of it. Yeah, and uh, there is a question from uh, I am Saronan, and he's asking uh, you are. An- you have an enormous uh, board presence a clear presence of a man who wants to win over the opponent and the game how did you cul- cultivate this uh, is the question oh i want to say hi to sarv <laughs> it's um, a great friend and um, yeah well i i do want to win games um i i don't know if i exactly know where i cultivated it um but there are some things that happened consciously some that happened um, i would say accidentally one of the reasons why i win <laughs> which is funny is that i mean win in the sense i i have decisive results so to just clarify my games are usually either i'm winning or losing right there is always like that i and uh, like my good friend kiram you you talk about it it's like we have opposite styles he, he would have nine games and maybe like seven draws or something like that <laughs> and he, he we would have the same score and i would have like three wins and two losses or something like that <laughs> so my games have always been like that but I also tend to I don't know sometimes overestimate my position because the funny thing is no matter what position you give me I'm sitting there thinking I'm winning. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, some kind of a uh, very good thing that happened to me because <laughs> I was always positive and always trying to win even in the worst position possible I'm trying to say oh if I do this if he falls for this trick I'm actually winning right I'm not actually sitting there thinking oh I have to survive and make draw and stuff like that. so some kind of ignorance turned out to be that blissful thing for me um in in terms of trying to win but in general the desire to win games have been there for a for a while i don't know maybe a natural thing i just wanted to win um having said that i also don't take losses that badly i mean i'm i'm still um in like not like the caspero kind of winning <laughs> kind of thing i i won't fall into that category i i do like to win so if you give me an equal position i won't take a draw i'll keep playing because I I think that even if I have slight chance I want to keep playing and uh, I I do like to do that um yeah I I think uh, some of it is lucky some of it is probably was already there <laughs> yeah so let's say someone wants to develop this kind of optimism and uh, they want to develop this uh, kind of you know desire to win um, so what should they do uh, what should they be doing in order to develop this skill or you know this kind of attitude interesting so i i just think it's the it's more i mean there are two ways i have looked at um the game at least i've seen different perspectives two different perspectives on the game one is that students play to just win because they want to win the game and the second thing is uh, players play to because they want to they want to enjoy the experience yeah they want to learn and they want to enjoy the experience so in both sense i feel like uh logically you can come to the same conclusion of keep you keep playing no matter what yeah and uh, i'm guessing this with the question you're also asking in some in terms of not taking draws and actually fighting it out is that right yeah 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 so the point is if you want to learn and you want to have a good experience right then you have to play right the point is uh, you could you could start the game and offer a draw there's nothing you got out of the game there's no fun in that right so to play all the way to the end is always taking a chance you might lose the game but you might win the game and uh, i i feel that balance always seems natural to me it seems like you have to take the chance because otherwise you're missing out on an opportunity of that experience and if you don't have that experience you're not learning right so you ended a game uh, and you got a draw and you got nothing going forward in the bigger picture that didn't seem to help or if you have the perspective let's say to really shoot for a win you are the kind of person who does not like to lose at all right and you just want to win then even then again it makes the same sense because i mean those kind of players usually don't take the draws i think they they play more fighting chess and they do want to win and uh, hopefully they don't have that but either way so the both the perspectives you have to logically come to this conclusion that you have to play the game you have to fight it out mm-hmm. there's nothing there's no way around that sometimes i think the reason why this doesn't happen is because of fear it's it's purely fear yeah you have a chance to win but you're also afraid of the chance that you might lose that is something you have to plainly overcome there is no way around it because if you don't take a chance i mean it's like they say i mean if you don't show up to the battle there's 
I mean, you're, <laughs> then then there's nothing. <laughs> you you can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So generally, when you have this kind of attitude, uh, we we often, uh, I mean, there is a possibility of losing as well. So generally, how did you deal with you know losing or you know failures and so on? I was a little easy going. I've been easy going um, in my life in general. I think uh, chess reflects, uh, of course, how we, um, how, what our characteristics are in life. So I have always been a little easy going. So I don't take results too much to heart. Of course, uh, I mean, to some extent, everybody cares. Yeah, I mean, that threshold is there. I'm not going to go below that. I mean, nobody plays a game to lose, and <laughs> we all hate losing, and uh, that that level is there for everyone. But my threshold is not too bad i i don't really maybe it'll bother me for a day and uh, after a day i'm i can move on and just get particularly if you're playing another game i i can generally move on i can try to refocus and say okay what is over is over and uh, some very hard losses might come back and haunt me <laughs> during the game i'll be sitting and thinking about it but i think that happens to everyone to some extent and then you shut your thought out and say wait i i have to focus on that again so that is uh, has to be a conscious thing though because sometimes i've noticed the biggest problem is during the same game i'll be playing a game i will do something and i would have messed up a really good position right and that will be haunting me when i'm playing the, this particular part of the game right and that i found was the most difficult part to deal with usually and uh, luckily i i have in general i also have a reputation of doing this i think like you keep fighting and keep pulling some random upsets <laughs> from losing positions so the part where you have to really refocus i think is very difficult um i believe aronian once uh, talked about it he said you know he tries to get up and walk around or you know try to uh, completely get change the perspective right because you're you're really sitting there and so pissed off at yourself <laughs> that something happened <laughs> and you have but but the fact is there is a position in front of you and uh, you have to give the best effort in that position whatever happened two moves ago or five moves ago is actually irrelevant so it's very difficult though that part i think is very difficult during the game itself i think most people might struggle with that and then eventually you'll have to come to terms terms with that and some people do really well some people don't but you have to put a conscious effort I and mean, you have to really mentally remember that no matter what right this is your current position until until the game is done there is something going on there you have to kind of reshift and say i have to start fighting from here yeah which is uh, a conscious effort yes yeah and before moving forward i'd like to ask a couple of audience questions uh, sure. so first of all uh, okay uh, kirti is asking uh, sir for a 1400 player is it necessary to analyze the opening before playing or to just find new ideas while playing is a question well you have to know your openings yeah i think there's no way around it uh, but you don't need to go too much in depth Uh, anything you study i think i would the main thing is if you can understand it you should study it right if you cannot understand it then you are probably pushing yourself too far in that area i'll probably openings will have that situation so if you study up to a certain point you can say okay these are the ideas these are things but then you start going too much in depth and say oh in this position this move was played by this player and this move was played by this player this is the improvement and you really cannot get your head around it right so then at that point i would say your your effort is still useful but not that useful so you should kind of try to keep this rule that if you can understand something the chances of you retaining that is more right even the stuff that you understand you we tend to forget but we might have to do it like twice or thrice before like you know i remember studying rook and pawn games forever like so many times i would go to a game and lose and then i'll come back and say wait i knew this end game right so the first time i would go there thinking oh i have studied this somewhere <laughs> that's the only thing i'll remember <laughs> and then i will end up messing it up the next time when i go now i'll have a much better recollection because i played again so yeah i think that's uh, the the overall thing there yeah yeah and uh, the next question is from ajan anthony and uh, is asking uh, i had a issue i used to find difficulty in calculating moves over the board uh, so i used to stand and calculate moves in tournament uh is saying i find it difficult to calculate in over the board but online i could i could calculate flawlessly is asking oh that's <laughs> interesting <laughs> i i usually see players other way around yeah i mean like i don't know what your experience is right generally uh, i mean even personally me right i i think i can tend to think a little bit better over the board uh, online i feel like is a little off for me i'm not 
I'm not at my best um, online. Well, I, I don't know um, exactly. I, I think what works best should be pretty flexible. I mean, I know some players who don't look at the board, stare at the ceiling. Um, <laughs> like the series Queen's Gambit where they show that. <laughs> so, um, I know some players who go stand in opponent's side and calculate all the time. Um, <laughs> so, I don't think you need to have a hard and fast rule for this. Whatever works is good as long as you don't really, in, you know, interrupt your opponent's thought or you, you don't create any interruption in the game. Or you don't, like, you know, make it look odd, right? If you can just find something that works for you um, and, and, you know, work that calculation into it, that should be that should be fine. If you want, if you like to stand up and calculate, that's uh, that's fine. I mean, it might be a little odd <laughs> for your opponent that you are standing up <laughs> the whole time <laughs> for, like, if you're playing a four or five hour game. But, but well, one thing I would recommend is uh, sometimes try to not tell the story completely, right? So if you keep repeatedly telling yourself that I can only calculate if I stand up, that might be a little bit of a trouble because there are times you have to sit down and play and you are putting yourself mentally in a, in a negative spot. You would already start, I mean, subconsciously you would start thinking that, oh, I'm, I'm not going to play my best because I'm sitting down, right? Yeah. So you could choose your best way to do your calculation, but uh, kind of be fluid with the stories. Don't think that this is the only thing that works for me because somewhere this will start and it will build and build and build and it will become you. <laughs> At some point, it will become you saying that, oh, I only stand and calculate. Nothing else works for me, right? And then the thing is, at this point, nothing can work for you because there is a very strong story in your head. When you do something else, you, are, you yourself are going to sabotage it, right? Yeah. So that's the only thing I'd be careful about. Yeah, and uh, this question is uh, from I am Saranen and it is very related to what we were talking about. And he's asking, you come across as a nice guy uh, in terms of principles and manners, balance of personality, etc. Is it possible to possess such uh, simplicity of personality and still be a world beater in chess? Oh, I would say, first of all, I want to give the compliment back to him as well. <laughs> this is uh, very mutual. I think I respect him very much for the same kind of qualities. So, I mean... This is, I guess, uh, an interesting question of do we do we have to be some in some sense ruthless and have not have certain qualities to actually become a world champion or like to the top? I don't believe there is any such thing though. I think yeah, it's possible. It's possible to uh, have your own personality and then work it out. Like I said, some players like to be um, extremely ruthless and that's how they want to play their game, and um, and that works for them. And that's fine. And some players are extremely, you know, they cannot be result oriented. Uh, I don't know if you guys follow cricket. I guess like Dhoni and Kohli's captaincy <laughs> kind of shows the difference. I mean, Kohli is like someone who wants to win the game. I, everyone can tell that, right? And if we go and teach him to calm down and mellow down, and it won't, he won't be the same person he is. And the same way around for Dhoni, yeah? if somebody told him he needs to go up and you know keep show his emotions and fight, that might not have worked. Either so at this point, after teaching a lot, I've kind of come to this idea that um, there are there are no written rules basically, right? You have a kind of set of guidelines in some sense, right? I mean, nobody wants to be rude to their opponent after the game. That I think everybody would blatantly agree is wrong. But during the game, if you some people can be say you know absolutely like you're my opponent, I'm crushing you. That's it, right? Some people are still in a certain way, but also your personality outside, the same thing. You go there, you ruthlessly study to win the game. And some people are just studying because they want to learn the game. I really don't care about anything else. I don't need to become a world champion. I just want to get better at the game, right? So I think this personality varies. And uh, I think either one can be the top, at the top. I don't see a reason why not. It's just that if they find the right balance and if they're able to do it, Hopefully, I mean, I would prefer that when I'm teaching to my students, right? I tell them all the time, I would be really proud of them if they become a GM and, you know, they go on to become very strong players. But what makes me more really proud is that they use chess in a nice way in their life, right? That's also important because we are chess players, but we have life overall. And they, you know, they learn the right spirit. They have the right attitude. They learn to lose. They learn to appreciate their opponent. They learn to understand the, the the difficulty of this, you know, working hard, discipline, all these things, every single part of being the sports person, I think that's the lesson that would make me more, I mean, personally, for me, uh, happier. Yeah. 
and uh, like when you were uh, playing uh, when you were young and so on what were your uh, goals uh, in terms of chess and um, like what did you want to become and so on Oh yeah, I was very clear about becoming a world champion. <laughs> I was young. <laughs> I had no doubts. <laughs> I was um, yeah, very very clear, but there was a phase when I really stagnated. I think that's when I started getting some self doubts. But when I started, yeah, I was uh, super uh, clear that I wanted to go all the way to the top. There was no questions. And uh, so there was a time when I I think this was around 12 or 13 years old, I don't remember exactly, but I I got I was top in the country in regarding to the juniors and everything and uh, I mean like with other youngsters of course uh, and uh, but but I stagnated it took me almost 3 4 years to get past this 2200 I was stuck in the 2200 rating for a long time so when that happened I think that's when my first doubt started creeping in and I um I also have to say that I was my discipline started going away so during that time i i was not working hard enough i was not focused enough i was uh, i was doing chess but the 7 8 hours so like my during my 10th grade i, I would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do to be able to do chess in the evening right mm-hmm. and i wish i had that kind of discipline during that time and i don't know where i would have been uh, it's always a question of you know could be <laughs> could i been right but i think the problem was um, anything all of this kind of bundles together i was not as disciplined i was not working hard enough my results were not showing up and then this became a big uh, cyclic thing so it took me like 3 4 years and then after like 3 or 4 years i quickly shot up though i immediately from 2200 became an im and i mean those days it was much more difficult <laughs> today with the rating coefficient and everything it was it's more na- normal actually <laughs> but when when we were playing at that level um shooting up like uh, like 200 points was like huge so within a year or so going up to 100 points was was good that brought me back and then i quickly also became a gm but by then i shifted my goals realistically at that time i came to university of texas at dallas to do my masters a bachelor's and masters so i kind of reshifted my focus i said okay chess is going to be in my life i'm going to be playing tournaments i'm going to enjoy it but um, i am not going to probably be a world champion <laughs> and also since you are talking about stagnation do you think like let's say if a person gets uh, stagnated let's say at a rating at a certain rating do you think he can um, become a grandmaster or even a world champion for that matter or do you think uh, that is it for him like after he gets stagnated no 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 yeah of course i think they can improve um so like i said i'm generally an optimist for example even today right um i don't think that i should not ever think that i cannot become a world champion i think that is just mentally blocking myself right so for example if i get up today and say i want to be a world champion well, the only realistic gap is can i put in the hours right can i study hard enough to even get close enough right now will i actually become a world champion i don't know that but the first thing i do know is it requires a certain amount of dedication and work and i need to put that in and this reason i i decide not to do those things is because i don't have that much time or commitment or even i mean those things are also escaping kind of statements i also have to say i'm also scared yeah will i be that disciplined will i be able to sacrifice everything and study so hard will I, do i have all the things that is required to become a world champion this is just all natural questions and fear right so um yeah i don't think that there is ever a point where you can say that you, you it's just not possible i think that's usually not my way of thinking if you are stagnated in in a certain point you could definitely move up um uh, but that's actually the most difficult part though like i said i think uh, in my personal experience and in my teaching experience what i notice is if you are stuck between a certain rating and if you are stagnating there it's a very vicious cycle and that's very tough to come out of it. it's like a chicken egg problem because to get out of it you need some confidence but you don't you will never get confidence if you are in that <laughs> so the only way to get out of some bad cycle is pure hard work and dedication you have to keep doing that work and relentlessly keep working on it and without giving up so that's the most difficult part it's always easiest said than done but that's the only way to really get out of it um the the pure hard work yeah as you were saying uh, it's very hard to you know work hard like especially when we are trying to work at chess uh, 
lot of uh, our mind tries to you know tries to lure us uh, into watching tv or you know going to facebook or whatever so generally what would uh, uh, your recommendation be and what you used to do in order to conquer your mind uh, i don't know if i could say i conquered my mind <laughs> so again it's a relative thing right i mean if i had worked the way i had worked early on continuously i might have reached a higher level which i don't know um so i don't first thing is i don't want to talk as if i've done the things in the right way <laughs> it's uh, it's it's i think pure chance that whatever i achieved i mean with of course effort and other things the things fell in fell in line but in general in terms of distraction other things again it's very very difficult it's uh, i mean it's it's all about getting the discipline and being in the right mind um we having the right frame of mind i can easily tell this because i've been in both places i have been places where i really feel like i i worked very hard like there are phases like i told you in my life where i really didn't even think twice about uh giving up the things that i had to give up to work on chess i don't know why frankly i don't know right i could have been easily distracted at that time by so many other things but uh i was just really studying chess and i i was in a in that culture right i was working with hari haran sir in in chennai and that's the time i'm talking about i used to go to his house and there used to be some kids who come in they never had had tv in their house there's no tv in their house their whole family had a culture that was unbelievably great kids would do their own chores i mean my house i sitting at home and asking my mom to bring food to my table <laughs> and uh, in some sense very spoiled yeah but then i got into this culture and i really really love, felt good about myself and i just kept doing it now could i have just uh, got distracted at that time it's possible right because the same person that was me there was a phase where i was getting distracted and i couldn't control that i couldn't really snap out of it to say listen no like you said no facebook or no wasting time i am going to study chess right somehow it was not possible at that time right so it's just not an easy answer the only thing i would say is try to be in a good environment because you need help right to snap out of things to actually do the right things um, it's important that you you are surrounded in the right environment and you are feeling the right way if you are surrounded with people who are uh, you know playing other things and doing other things it's, it you, you just made your life even more difficult which is not required so it's uh, it's an environment thing it's a chance thing and i i would definitely not claim that i know the answer to that <laughs> yeah and uh, coming to you know dealing with pressures and so on you became grandmaster in um, 2006 i think if i'm not wrong and uh, generally people have this uh, pressure you know when they are trying to score norms or uh, there a lot of people have missed their norms due to the extreme pressure so generally how do you deal with uh, pressure and uh, and also during that phase did you uh, like how, how was the like whole process Yeah luckily I never felt that kind of pressure though I am usually not that kind of a person um I'm a very laid back easy going person so that kind of helped me in that scenario I completed my title in 2005 it was officially um given in 2006 so during those 2 3 years I was playing pretty good and uh, I, w- I was missing some norms by small margin and stuff like that so I was not ne- essentially um you know taking too much pressure i like i said it's more of a personality thing some people like to really do a certain way and i'm very casual and easy going in general so when i played these tournaments i would be like okay i would just play and i would not really sit there thinking about the result or like thinking about oh i need to win this uh, to become this or something like that and of course i felt pressured like during the last game or something if i have to complete my norm or uh, or something like that um but yeah overall i would say it's uh, it's a personality thing yeah so i i really never really <laughs> it's it's a lucky thing again i mean i didn't have to go through that particular process so much i mean in some sense uh, the you were talking to i saw your video deepan <laughs> right and kiran when i was checking out some of the videos in some sense like we have similar style we were a little bit more carefree in terms of playing um yeah yeah and um, uh, coming to you know physical fitness and so on like uh, what were you doing for uh, physical fitness uh, in your own life and like do you think physical fitness is uh, as imp- important as it is you know uh, as it is said yeah i think it's very important <laughs> i think it's extremely important and uh, it's also the kind of building blocks for your discipline so uh, i mean again i can speak 
as a person who has been in both on both sides i have worked for so like worked in the sense i've tried so hard and failed to came in a discipline of physical fitness i've also succeeded for for a period of time in fact right now is a good phase for me since the pandemic started i've been doing some online physical fitness and it's working very well for the last 6 7 months i've been doing very regularly so now i'm in a good phase but usually i'm very clear about what i can and cannot do so this is uh, this doesn't let me think like i know how to do this <laughs> because i know uh, that it's all a momentum and um, you know keeping this going right suddenly something stops and it's very difficult to rebuild it because there are times i have done this i've tried very hard to build a momentum and keep it going and it doesn't happen at all right but overall i would say fitness is very important also as you are getting older so i i'm realizing it more and more now when i have to play a 5 hour game or 7 hour game it's okay i can play one game easy um i can even play so right now in my physical fitness i can clearly see that if i play a two round tournament i mean two rounds a day tournament um most of the us tournaments fit did it once or like that i after six games after the first three days i can be fine for the first three days but the last two days is is actually i can clearly see it i'm making intuitive choices because i don't want to calculate anymore <laughs> i'm also taking decisions because i don't want to sit there for five hours anymore i'm i can i can feel that i'm tired because you're playing five hours and five hours so it's like 10 hours every day and you're playing you play for three days and uh, that fighting spirit we talked about right no matter what position you have you want to play for a win right I cannot have that in the last two days and I'm I'm seeing that. I'm naturally going towards okay I'll take draw or it's okay you know I have to be more realistic about what my <laughs> energy and resources are right. So I think fitness is very very important but I also want to point out that fitness is very specific. So you do need general fitness but you need chess fitness too. I think spending 10 hours continuously for 5 days or 7 days is not going to happen because you run every day. <laughs> so you can run every day and you should be fit that's that is actually important but you also want to build the chest stamina right you want to work on chest for 8 10 hours a day and if you can do that for 5 6 days continuously or maybe 10 days continuously now that is your training for chest fitness you can go to a double round tournament and do all those things now if you are young and uh, i don't know if you are like less than 30 if you're not um if you're in that age group <laughs> you guys can easily handle it <laughs> you don't have to I mean I didn't have to worry about it at least at that time. I was able to manage anything and uh, because I was I don't know maybe the age was the factor. And now I'm beginning to feel that the age is um is a factor in terms of energy. So I know it's a cliche everybody says that uh, you have to do physical fitness you have to be there I mean it's just as an actual sport where you need more uh, physical strength. I I do I do believe in that. You have to be fit um so I was like really not worried about what i would eat or i was extremely i would eat a chocolate bar before going into the game i would for breakfast i would have like you know a donut before going into the game i would not think at all when i was much younger and now i i feel like i cannot do that it's just not possible anymore if i if i do something like that going into a game <laughs> after like the two hours i'm like falling asleep <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, again moving forward like uh, before going forward uh, let me read some of the comments first of all grandmaster sham sundar is saying uh, hi and is saying i still remember your fantastic games from kolkata open especially the game in accelerated dragon oh, hey, hey sham nice to see you but um, i don't know kolkata was uh, i'm trying to remember the accelerated dragon it was maybe against gusino i'm thinking exactly what that game was i do remember the the funniest story behind that game maybe that's what he's talking about so i was playing white and um i was playing against if i remember right it was gusino and um it was actually a dragon so i usually walk into the game and i play any line i want i would play e4 d4 knight of 3 some stuff like that <laughs> so for that game i decided to play e4 and it ended up being an accelerated dragon structure and i played the bind and i am usually very positional like you know solid structure kind of player and uh, at some point uh, he played a5 so i was like okay this is very anti position <laughs> because i am very used to studying the edge old lines where black plays a6 and b5 and that's usually the plan <laughs> or you play the edge jog with a6 b6 setup and at some point play b5 right so he played a5 and i was sitting there wondering okay this is uh, this is really not good <laughs> 
and he's just giving me the b5 square and he's like i don't know what he's doing so i ended up winning the game so easily <laughs> I, i beat him in like 25 moves and uh, this is again ignorance is bliss right <laughs> so when i came out uh, kirambi was there other everyone like was like very happy they like oh you beat like a very strong player and i was like yeah and then we i we were talking about the game and i said he played this this looks very bad yeah <laughs> <laughs> then they all looked at me as like this is like the most trendy main line <laughs> they can play a5 a4 knight a5 something like that and uh, i was like really you can do that and uh, so that's a great example of uh, ignorance right if i had known that i would not have been sitting there with that the confidence that i actually had right i'm sitting there thinking i'm punishing my opponent <laughs> like even though it's like a 2600 plus and uh, he's done something i was i'm thinking oh maybe he's trying something new right um but i i think i'm i have a more sound and solid position so i can beat him <laughs> so that really made me win the game quite easily so if i yeah if i if i if someone had told me if i had that information that that was actually a thing and black gets a good position out of that i would have not won that game <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and there is a question from uh, arvind and uh, he's saying you became the 12th uh, grand master of india in 2006 and then 54 grand masters in the next 14 years how did india become a gm uh, grand master powerhouse Oh yeah that's that's great um that's actually a great thing for me to watch it has become uh, one of the strongest and you know upcoming chess powerhouse in in, uh, in the world and uh, i have to say it's a, a lot of things together um the first thing is i think the chess training has gotten very very good the kind of resources we had when we were growing up was very very limited um i believe ramesh started the trend at some point where he started training with the younger kids i don't know have, did you work with ramesh uh, no i didn't actually get the opportunity oh uh, so i have played with him and other things but i know i was just asking because a lot of gms <laughs> eventually i had worked with <laughs> yeah so the thing is uh, he started a very nice trend where the training was more uh, in, so i the the clear shift in picture happened this way for me when i used to play a gm i was always scared I used to sit across the GM, and I would not play there, uh, play the game like I'm. I'm like super confident that I'm going to beat this GM, right? There are some games I would feel like yes, I have a chance, I have a fighting thing, but there's always this respect, which is good, but that respect always almost turned into fear, which is not good, right? When you're playing a game, you you want to respect your opponent, but you don't want to be afraid of your opponent because then you don't you you're giving up your chance of beating them, right? Yeah. That changed. That changed. very much um between i would say between 2005 to 2010 i started seeing the change when i was traveling and playing in k tournaments in india i started seeing youngsters playing against me like they were going to beat me you know <laughs> they i mean i didn't feel any fear at all and i was like what is going on <laughs> and so one of the reasons they started getting access they're training with gms they're training and they're getting material they're working on this material and uh, they have access to so much right i i remember watching negi grow up and uh, parimarjan become a very strong player and the same thing he had access to all the material of course he worked very hard to get there but the fact is he had exposure right at a year, very young age he was playing a lot of gms so he's kind of playing a gm was a normal thing to him he wouldn't really sit there and be worried about it right and as you as that built up that's exactly what happened i think um, the more and more access that was available to information the fear started dropping and then the, the that gap was bridged and right now i think i literally people are scared to come to india to play <laughs> yeah. yeah 1800s and 2000s in india are like are beating gms so <laughs> yeah and a very related question to that it's from aaron and uh, he's saying though there are a lot of gms in india why are they not able to break into top 10 what is it uh, that india is missing is asking ah oh, that's a great question actually i think that's going to happen soon but um one of the reasons i think is that because um like for example anand or uh, you know um hari or vidit uh, these top players sashikiran right um they are all this is our 2700 club now the thing is there is a lot of information on how to get to 2500 and 2600 there is not the same level of information to get to 2700 and also getting to 2700 at that point might not be just purely work and talent alone right there are thousands of other things also probably so that gap uh, i think will be closed when 
we have more and more people guiding so now they are all active players they are all playing very seriously right so um, the example of ramesh is ramesh started teaching after he retired stop playing the same thing with me right i can teach students i can show them the path on how to get to gm based on my experience right i cannot show them the path to get to 2700 because that's pure speculation i can just give some ideas and i i can give some sound ideas there's nothing wrong with that but i won't be able to teach out of experience i won't be able to teach out of uh, a clear path out of my my real uh, way i progress right so that's the thing i think that is right now so you can have a training with a grandmaster right now like so many are there more and more people are training with grandmasters and they are they are getting there easily because of that now they have the information and the wealth of uh, experience that the grandmasters can share but that's not there for the 2700 yet they don't know how to get to 2700 not a lot of people know and they're all not completely teaching it which is understandable right anand is still playing uh, which is amazing yeah so at, at a competitive level right so yeah so i think at some point the more and more training or access that players have to the 2700 and 2800 group uh, they are probably going to break that barrier and we are going to get a lot more numbers there too yeah and uh, one more question from arvind is asking uh, do you think chess does not get the attraction it deserves uh, sit, uh, since it requires a lot of uh, a lot of level of intellect to appreciate the game itself as opposed to something like cricket which is quite easier to understand oh uh, it's a natural thing i'm usually not bitter about it i do agree chess doesn't get enough uh, chess is not a spectator sport though right um i enjoy other sports too and uh, i'm i know sometimes i got seen like a negative uh, talk about how uh, we don't get something in other sports they get something i'm usually not bitter or negative about it the reason i would simply say is because uh, the way it is that's the way it is right uh, if if you come and show me something new right and uh, if that's something that i cannot understand instantly you cannot expect me to watch it or you cannot expect me to follow it i think it's kind of unfair right yeah uh this is one of those problems that's circumstantial it's just the way it is chess is not easy i can explain the rules of soccer to you in 2 minutes and take you to a soccer game right you might not have never seen a soccer game in your life i can explain that in 2 minutes right uh, cricket might take 10 minutes <laughs> in fact cricket a little bit more complicated <laughs> but uh, that's why soccer and basketball kind of games are very easy and um, also very entertaining i i really enjoy soccer a lot it's great because it's so easy and it's easy to easy to follow so if people are not following chess um, because they're not able to understand it i think it's uh, it's unfortunate but it's that's how it is my hope is that uh, we'll reach a point that everybody actually plays chess probably like we make chess like almost like math yeah. which i think is not a bad thing to think uh, in terms of a vision is because i think just like we we learn all the required things like building blocks in our school chess could be a building block if chess reaches that kind of a level then it will be really good because everybody will know a certain basic level of chess going in and then chess could become a spectator sport of course it's a very high climb but it's it's the only way i see that it can it can happen otherwise i think it's unfair to ask someone um or to have the same kind of claim like a cricket or anything like that. it's just not going to be possible yeah yeah and now let's come to the chess part of the interview so first of all i want to start with like how you how do you used to analyze your games and also the there was a related question from anirudh like how to analyze a chess game sure so i mean uh, right now or you're asking about how i used to do it when i was uh, like first working uh, on how you used to analyze and then like what do you think is the correct way to analyze currently sure so game analysis is one of the dry part and also the difficult part of chess learning because to do game analysis you have to learn to be self critical you need to be more mature to do that right most players um don't have that sometimes you analyze a game you don't really realize that you know um or you're not open to accepting your faults which is very difficult you know not to blame anyone which is difficult for me which is difficult for anyone right because if you go look at your game you want to be able to say um you know i made it video about intellectual honesty um that's kind of important in an analysis if you're not critical of, about yourself you cannot learn if you are not open to say wait i messed up and that's not with an excuse right you we are always looking for excuses as human when we are looking at a game and we are analyzing it we're thinking oh you know what this happened this happened this happened. so you want to build that story very quickly 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I blundered because this happened. Yeah? But the thing is, you have to sit down and really go into that thought process, right? Why did you blunder? Why did you make that choice, right? Why did you? And sometimes you will make a move and then someone will make a response and you will have a move to that. So you'll kind of play on with it. But the fact is you will hide this this thing somewhere deep inside that you actually didn't see that move, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's It's not going to be an open conversation. It's never going to be an open thing even within yourself. You would never think, wait, I did not see the next move. Why not? That's actually a big problem, right? I could That could cost a game somewhere else. Even though in this particular game, I was able to get out of it because I had some other solution, right? Yep. But the fact is analysis, that's what needs to be done, right? Because if I don't know why I missed that move, even though it's the very next move, and, and if I'm not actually thinking about it, I cannot fix that particular problem. So I'll tell you what I used to do and what I would love to do going forward and what I recommend. So what I used to do, of course, is spend um, a lot of time in general analysis. That is what most people do. That is, you look at the game, you try to find out the critical points, you go into the, uh, you do the calculation. I mean, you look at positions where you want to calculate moves to figure out what is going on. You want to talk about, think about the positional stuff that's going on. So this is general analysis in terms of chess. So this is the only thing I did. I remember a very interesting um, incident. So Shashikaran's dad, Krishnan, he is a great coach himself, very dedicated. He pushed Shashikaran to the heights that he reached. So uh, me and my dad, we met him at some point asking for advice. And I remember him giving me a set of games, like 50 games or so. And uh, he gave me two sets, like 150, 50 of those games, not unlaced, the other 50 unlaced. So he said, you take these 50 games, sit and unlace each and every game. And you would say, unlace it for hours, days, weeks, whatever you want. <laughs> no timeline to it, right? You sit and keep on analyzing these games. Now, some game makes you interesting that you're analyzing for two, three days, keep on going with it. There's no timeline, right? And in the end, you compare notes to see what the actual evaluation is and to see what why you missed something or what happened. And I thought this was great. I have to be honest, I didn't complete the 50 games. <laughs> I, I probably did like 10 games and I felt it was very tough and again, coming back to the tiring, disciplined work, right? And I ended up giving up on that. But I really wish that if I go back, I did those <laughs> all those 50 games. But okay, so this is the kind of analysis that I did. But now I feel like there is also one more kind of analysis that I already talked a little bit about. That is understanding your thought process. I think that has more value than the chess part itself. Because I think most people work on chess anyways, right? They're doing their calculation. They're, sol- they're studying books. They're doing things. That helps. But the idea of your game analysis, like self-analysis, has to be to find out problems with your game. Right? So you can improve on them. And that can only come clearly with being this self-critical on on thought process, not just the moves. Right? Not saying why this is the wrong move, that's the right move. But more like, why did I make that choice? Right? And, And you go dig deeper to come over this thing. So one of the things I recommend that students do is to write down your thoughts about the game, which does not include any other conclusion outside the game. So for example, you finish a game, you come back, write down every single thought you had in the game, because this is more like a log that you keep of what happened. So to analyze the game, you need this information, right? Because after two days, three days, you play two more games, you're not going to remember that. So what I would recommend is first write down everything. And this information has to be purely what you saw during the game. Even if it's a checkmate you saw, write it down, right? So at some point, you can look at that and that will be like a reflection into your mind. So you would look at it and say, okay, this is what I did during the game. And uh, you will be fascinated to find very interesting information if you do that. And I can truly recommend that. I have done that for a few games. Again, I'm not going to claim that I do that regularly. Um, When I realized this thing, I did... Um, actually, I did this one one example I can give you was startling for me was there's one game that I lost and I just had this big feeling that I, I really need to know what I was thinking. Why did I decide like this and how did I end up losing? And I wrote down the whole set of information. Like I did not even write one move outside of that, right? Whatever I figured out after the game, I, did, I just exploded that. So I didn't really care about it. I just wanted to know every move, every variation that I actually captured during the game. So I put this whole set of thoughts down and then I looked at it and I realized there was one position. I had calculated like 15 moves ahead. And I was actually thinking about a rook and pawn in game where I was up a pawn. <laughs> and I was trying to win that rook and pawn in game at that point, right? And then I just realized that this is just absolute waste of time. 
I was spending time in a position where I would be upper. I mean, the middle game is actually equal, <laughs> <laughs> and either of us can get an advantage. The more critical problem is going to be positions where my opponent is going to fight for initiative, right? Not be down upon a rook and pawn in game <laughs> where he's trying to defend. So that was one of the things that just hit me in my face right there. There could be other small things that you can find out when you do this. But I just realized that I am calculating variations that are kind of useless, irrelevant in that position. And I need to trim it down, right? And um, the reason I even decided to do this is because of one of those experiences. I played a move, spending 15, 20 minutes. And then the very next move my opponent played, I didn't see it. So I, that is the reason I got into a little bit of a shock. And I said, OK, how is that possible? Right. Yeah. I spent 15 minutes, 20 minutes calculating in this variation. I've calculated so many variations. How is it possible that I did not see my opponent's next move? Right. So that's kind of the motivation for me to do it. But I would recommend that for everyone. Like I said, if you want to improve, you want to see what's going on in your head. And the only person, your coach cannot do it. Nobody can do it because you're sitting there when you're playing your game. You're the only person who knows what's happening in your head. So you have to write it down. That's the only way. And do you think after doing that uh, checking engine for, you know, uh, objectivity is wrong or do you think uh, like what what is your opinion on using engines uh, for analyzing a game? No, I think engines are great. You just have to use it the right way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you study, so if your goal again is to improve your calculation, then engine is useless, right? Engine is only used for validation. So if I, let's say, set up a position to my student, and I want him to build his calculation and I want him to think. So what you, he could do typically is to calculate, spend hour, like half an hour, whatever it is that the time is required. And then you can validate that with the engine to see, okay, what is right and what is wrong, right? So at that time, the engine will only be used as more of a validation to say right or wrong. At the same time, let's say you're preparing an opening. You want to actually find the evaluation of the position, right? You're more interested in, is this a good position or not a good position? Now, you clearly, engine is going to do a much better job for you, right? So you turn the engine on right away. You keep it running for longer periods of time. You play different kind of moves and check the engine uh, evaluation. So you, at this point, your goal is to evaluate the position, right? So you have to just understand the difference. If you're evaluating the position, yes, engine is great. If you're trying to improve your chess, uh, no, I don't think engine is <laughs> going to help you at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, again, moving for before moving forward, there's a question from again, I am Saranan and uh, like many Indian grandmasters have taken to, you know, chess coaching for uh, livelihood nowadays, even when young and have uh, playing ambitions. Is it realistically possible to be a coach and achieve big in chess as well? Well, I think it's possible, yeah, because I think um, a lot of GMs that are, are like title players or anyone else who's teaching, um, are probably teaching at a higher level now. Um, I think usually the difficulty is if you're teaching um, much, much younger kids, like what I do, <laughs> it's uh, you have to have more, <clears throat> you have to compartmentalize it a little bit more uh, because uh, the problems that I've faced, for example, is that I would teach pins and skewers and stuff like that. And then when I initially started teaching that, I could not separate it very easily when I went to my game. Yeah. Because I would be looking at pins and skewers in the game. <laughs> I'd be, wait, this is a pin. So if I play this, I can, and I would also be thinking about lesson plans. I would literally be looking at something saying, wait, if I play this, I could, um, you know, show this to my students, right? Yeah. So it took me a while to really compartmentalize and say, okay, when I go to my game, right, I had to play a little bit, warm up a little bit and be more ready, which are the things I didn't have to do before. And I had to do it a little bit more to do that. But the main distinction I want to make is chess coaching is actually a, a more of a more of a teaching profession, right? Um, I see a lot of teachers doing that, but uh, it's it's a very different profession in my in my opinion. Playing is very different from teaching. Yeah, you can. I mean, lots of people are are doing it, but my recommendation would be that you should really enjoy teaching, right? Look at it as a teaching profession and ask yourself, do you really like it as a teacher, right? And that I've seen a lot of people do, and they really enjoy that, right? And that's the reason you should be doing it. The The other way around is like, let's say you, you look at yourself as a chess player and you're just like kind of teaching. I mean, you can do that on the side. It's still very valuable for some student who's just learning, you, uh, talking to you and getting your experience. But it's not the same, I think. It, yeah. I think it'll be much better 
if you look at your teaching as a separate profession itself so in that sense the the question that i think saranan was asking was more about a time time constraint right if you are going to teach it's going to take your time away from um, what you're going to do as a as a professional player and you'll need to put an extra effort to compartmentalize these two things and uh, if it is if you are going to do those things i think it's still possible to to keep going at it yeah yeah and one more question from anu srivatri he is asking um, shasha uh, i'm i suppose he is referring to grishuk so shasha once said yeah. that uh, to play blitz better you should get better at classical but uh, both are completely different formats what's your thought on this uh, and how to get better at blitz sir well you have to i mean um, i think it seems to make sense because if you are not good at general play right blitz is still enough time for most players these days <laughs> the, our our trend is going to bullet and hyper bullet so blitz is plenty of time to win a blitz game you need to have, have sound chess <laughs> so if you mess up your play in general i don't think you will get good to serve in in blitz yeah I particularly as you get stronger and stronger and so that's the point behind it you have to no good chess but the difference is of course in blitz you are playing more intuitively yeah so you are just making decisions very quickly and uh, playing with a lot of intuition and that is kind of uh, the difference in in classical chess you can pick and choose you can say okay in this position i want to intuitively decide in this position i actually want to sit down and calculate and because this is very um, critical right yeah and you don't get to do that in blitz as much 90% of your game is basically intuitive maybe very rarely in a position you will spend like 30 seconds or something like that right but overall yeah you have to play sound chess even in bullet actually i used to think initially bullet you can play whatever you want and then i realized bullet games have quality <laughs> <laughs> you mean you drop you drop something i mean this is online play i realized how quick players are i'm not so good at um online blitz in general blitz i'm okay um uh, online blitz particularly not so good at I uh, I recently even started knowing making pre moves. <laughs> But then yeah like in in 5 seconds they're doing like I don't know 30 moves. <laughs> so when when with that level of speed basically you you what we are learning is let's say you have a lost position with 30 seconds on the board you're lost right there is nothing that can be done so you need to have sound chess uh, no matter what. Yeah. and uh, coming back to chess uh, you mentioned that uh, you could play any opening e4 d4 c4 and uh, so how was your uh, work on openings uh, generally i think this is a so question but most people know the answer to <laughs> my my openings have not been very um I mean I I wouldn't call myself an opening expert let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I I know my openings that I've played for years and uh, of course I have play with general understanding more than more than actual moves. And uh, that's the reason why with white I generally find this flexible option I can play whatever I want as white because I don't really care whether I know or I don't know. So as long as I take my opponent to a position where he doesn't know or she doesn't know and I don't know I'm fine. <laughs> so i i'm usually very like i said my confidence will kick in i'll be like i can beat anyone <laughs> <laughs> and i might be winning or losing is irrelevant <laughs> yeah. so i'm usually like that um i have not very very rarely have actually achieved winning positions out of opening and it's very rare in my games there are few games and there are few things that i've studied to do that in fact the last tournament in hastings i spent a lot of time in openings <laughs> because i was playing from a huge gap so every day i used to study like 2 3 hours of preparation before the game which i think was very normal for most people but for me it was very new <laughs> i had to i had to do that for my for my openings so in general i have not studied um much in, in or invested a lot of time in openings um at all that's just been my thing after a point it also became a story like i told the other um, person who asked the question it became a story and it became a problem for me like you start telling yourself oh wait i'm not an opening expert i study in games i play middle game and i'm good at that then you start telling yourself that you're bad at the openings right yeah. so over a period of time it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger mental block to to actually fix that and study it so i mean i'm i have changed my perspective um in in different ways but um but overall yeah openings have not been my strong area i would like to 
<laughs> probably work more and, and and you know get get better at it but it's also the most time consuming yeah. <laughs> right so much to study now that the theory has gone so deep in so many areas it's just really time consuming so i think of a practical way to just take my opponent out of the opening with some random lines and <laughs> yeah and uh, okay i have played with your students uh, pravin balakrishnan and also brandon jacobson in uh, charlotte open and i remember when i was preparing against uh, brandon jacobson i saw that he even plays h6 a6 kind of move <laughs> so when you uh, when you see your student play h6 and a6 do you say to yourself why am i coaching this guy or <laughs> you're okay well i'm not going to take credit for brandon playing h6 or a6 and i'm not going to i'm going to stay indifferent on that <laughs> well the thing is yeah i don't believe in that though so i mean like kids uh, i mean I, i cannot call him a kid anymore brandon and praveen they they were taking lessons with me when they were much younger and uh, i mean they were around 2200 at that level when they were doing the lessons and now um they are studying their openings quite a bit which is good but they also have this uh, i i don't know again we young and uh, <laughs> the strong feeling that you can get away with anything right i mean that's that's i guess in some sense fun but it won't last for a longer period of time to do that continuously i i think it's more of a fooling around kind of thing maybe uh but in general you can play any openings you want but i believe in sound chess principles <laughs> so i mean i could choose different lines and i don't mind getting into any position with anyone that is unknown but i don't want to i i usually don't compromise on 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 sound chess principles i want to get a position that i believe is 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 reasonable right you know i've done things in a reasonable way to get there <laughs> so i i am not going to take <laughs> much of a credit or anything for uh, for that i think that's more of just like i said like an experimenting thing where i think kids want to do something funny and troll or something <laughs> i don't know yeah, yeah and uh, coming to you know middle game play uh, there are a lot of uh, middle game is so wide and uh, there are a lot of aspects to improve so generally how should one uh, approach you know middle game play and uh, like how should they improve basically uh, the middle game part i guess the most uh, common well known answer i think is classics yeah so we study master games and classics and world champions and i would say this is uh, probably the age old recommendation and that doesn't change in my opinion i think this is very old school but it's very good you have to get better at middle game you want to study a lot of different positions it's basically just you getting to understand the patterns more right so you you would get really good at a certain pawn structure if you have studied maybe hundreds of games in that pawn structure as simple as that right now how would you know if these move games are good only if they're from good players <laughs> so it just comes down to that essentially so when you're studying enough games played by world champions masters strong players you are starting to see a, a kind of uh, convergence in plans right you see oh alakain did this capablanca did this i mean this player also did this i mean you see that oh all good players are doing this right in this pawn structure this is how they're playing it right and you might not consciously remember that but that's how you're kind of getting better right so planning and strategy has to be um in in some sense by studying master games and classics and um you know that's that's the only way. it's it's basically patterns right you're recognizing these patterns and plans and uh, the more and more you study because there are lots of those things in middle game and it's it's just not easy to uh i mean i also say that middle game planning has, does not have the same kind of um what should say literature as, as tactics or other things or calculation or something like that i mean if you want to improve your calculation i think it's very more focused and there's probably more books and more things to do it but middle game planning is a little ambiguous yeah it's it's bigger there are lots of uh, books and other things that give you some structure to it but not um there's no one answer so yeah that's that's why i would say yeah classics are are a great way to improve your middle game yeah and uh, okay i want uh, recently one of my friend i don't want to mention his name so he attended a camp of uh, grandmaster chuchalo and uh, grandmaster vidit uh, organized by chess base india i think so generally he was telling me that uh, chuchalo uh, believes that uh, studying classics is a waste of time because uh, uh, like most of the <laughs> variations are you know refuted and he was also telling me that um, 
Vidit recently bought a book uh, 100 selected games by Botwinning and he found out that lot of analysis were uh, you know engine engines were refuting so the basic belief of him was that classics is a waste of time so what is your opinion <laughs> on that okay now i'm going directly into it well i i don't i mean my school of thought is different um i mean i don't know about what they're talking about in general i can just tell you what my beliefs are so the thing is the computer what it says or evaluates to me to some sense is irrelevant um i know chess is going more and more towards precise play but if botwinning did something for the human understanding i think that has a lot of value to it even if it is wrong right my my point is this i'm not asking you to study the classics so you can actually figure out that exact move uh, or say in this position this is the right move right what you're learning is that in a certain position there are certain plans you have to step down a little bit further right now let's say i am someone who's new to a certain pawn structure i don't know what to do in this pawn structure right yeah. how would i know what kind of play is good in this pawn structure i might not want to know the exact moves because when i go to my game i'm not going to remember the exact move right yeah. i really don't care what the exact move was played in that position i don't care about that what i do care is in this structure i want to put my pieces here in this structure i don't want to trade queens in this structure i want to keep this light squared bishop right this kind of information is what is going to help you make better decisions in middle game plan now for calculation they might be right right because if i am going to look at that particular position and i'm going to take botnik's move as a as a right move then i'm actually making a mistake right because i'm trying to calculate i'm looking at a move that was actually flawed and i'm thinking that's the best move now that is misleading and that's what maybe they're talking about so in that sense yes you should not be studying how to calculate from a set of variations that are not precise yeah right it's like you grading your answers with bad uh, <laughs> you know with bad kind of uh, answer sheet <laughs> right so you might find out that you 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 might think that you did something wrong uh, whereas you might have done it right because the whole thing is uh, you know not interpreted correctly so yeah i want to distinguish that right because if you are trying to understand planning and um, the structure and themes and stuff like that i think classics are great because uh, you really don't care about did they, they play 100% right i mean i really don't care right in in, the, in that position he came up with this plan which seems reasonable right or sometimes you might say this plan was wrong and that's also reasonable to understand that with the game and it's also a human nature right we go to a board we sit down and we play like humans we're not going to play like computers right if i play like botwinning i'll be very happy <laughs> with this <Yeah>. loss <laughs> so that's the kind of separation i'll put and again every coach when they're talking about something they have a very specific thing in mind right sometimes it's misunderstood um like i said it could be that you know there are some things that you're trying to do right now for that studying classics is irrelevant but if there is something that you're actually trying to do that, that, that might make more sense and my school of thought in general is that there are no set rules yeah so there are no set rules anywhere i don't think i can make any blanket statements like this is good and that is bad right it's a very very relative situation for everything right so uh, something that you call bad might be very very useful somewhere something that you call really good i can find places where it's extremely harmful to you so it becomes a very relative thing uh, on what is good and what is bad yeah very true so since we have uh, we don't have much time we'll move on to your uh, chess career and so on so first of all i i wanted to start Uh, with Asian Junior Championship in Sri Lanka, which you won. So, what was your general, um, you know, expectations before the tournament, and your, uh, you know, general um, in terms of feelings after winning the tournament? Oh yeah, that was a great tournament. I think so many interesting things were happening in my life at that time, and I was extremely happy. I've always remembered that uh, the good results have come to me in my life when I have been in good place mentally. <laughs> I had just gotten my admissions to University of Texas at Dallas that um it was 2003 January if I remember right and I had taken one semester of classes as an undergrad student in telecommunication major in um eventually I switched to computer science but I was doing one I did my first semester in US it was like really fresh for me because I came to study and I was looking at you know new perspective in life and I'm getting new experiences it was a lot of fun and uh, right when I did the did the did the first semester this opportunity came in where i got i had won the national juniors before that 
and I had the chance to play in the both Asian and World Juniors, and I was like very excited about it, but I was not so sure if I can do it because I'm going to be in US, right? Yeah. So what happened was um, after my semester was done, my my professors were very extremely kind to me. They were like, you know, I would email them saying this is what's happening. I have a camp for a month. I had a one month camp, so they were kind of to prepon their some of the exams. I mean now. after i understand the how the system works most of these things are very easy to do and natural because professors are extremely accommodating particularly when you are playing in world level tournaments <laughs> and but at that time it was just like a thing to me i was like oh you know because university exams in india are set exams it's not what professor is deciding <laughs> right so i was like they moved the university semester exam to me for me in front is what my dad would be like wow they did that but then each professor actually sets their own date for the exam <laughs> so they could move it into it's it's actually very much possible i mean they still have to put in the effort to do it um but the thing is it it was possible so that happened and when i came and i had a one month camp with vladimir i would say it's a very good time for me i learned so much in that one month camp and uh, right after the camp there was world junior and asian juniors i don't remember which one i played first if i remember right maybe Mm, I don't I actually don't remember which one came in first. So Asian Juniors I was still rooming with the Grandmaster Arun Prasad and uh, he was he was a few years younger to me and uh, I had this absolutely carefree attitude like uh, I mean which is generally usual for me but I was really having a blast. It was in a place called Nagambo and I mean it was a beach resort there was a swimming pool there was like a table tennis ping pong place nearby so we'd play table tennis we would you know you know we would swim in the pool and I don't know if you can call it swimming we were just kind of walking around <laughs> but and uh, you know the in, we were having a great time in the be- at the beach so it was a really really good place for me mentally and uh, that helped a lot so first few games i how ha- i have to say i was extremely lucky as well so i remember at least uh, some very clear games um, one of the game was against a player named akbarnia and uh, i remember this very clearly because he was leading the tournament with me if i remember right we were like all winning some games and we were in a good place and i'm playing against him and uh, one of those classic things that i talked about happened i missed a move so right at the beginning Uh, right out of the opening i'm playing black and i just blunder something and the only way to survive is if i if my black king goes to e5 <laughs> in the middle of the board <laughs> and this is the middle game right otherwise i'm just down two pawns or something like that i'm just lost right yeah of course the first the kind of person i am i'm like oh, i'm going to take a chance i'm not going to just do this i'm going to take my king to e5 <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like putting my king and walking out my king as if i've calculated this and i think i'm i'm like actually making a choice here right <laughs> so i was there and then he was calculating and he was playing and then as always uh, once i start fighting at that particular point um i i i created my chances right there are chances and he missed some important moves and that's it i'm my king was back on b8 and i'm up a piece so i managed to win that game and uh, again i would say very lucky to be in the right situation but my fighting chess kind of helped a lot to to get that and then the next um game so this is one extremely lucky game and the next lucky game was against uh, g rohit um this uh, very talented player i mean doesn't play chess anymore i think he um he switched his career yeah. but yeah his game was extremely weird i i remember uh, just blundering upon i mean like like out of <laughs> out of the opening like nothing i mean like it's not even a tactic is bishop would be on g7 or something you play bishop takes b2 or something i would be down like a bunch of pawns so i was playing white and then i just like was like thinking oh my god what did i do right and then out of nowhere he starts sacrificing stuff like for no reason i mean he could he doesn't have to sacrifice anything i think he sacrifices queen and something that's one of the weirdest games i have played <laughs> and uh, i ended up winning the game and i came out thinking uh, how on earth did i manage to <laughs> win this game <laughs> so those two games were extremely lucky for me but other than that the tournament is very solid i think most strong tournaments that you end up winning you need one or two lucky breaks like that right you can yeah. play a bunch of good games but you need some luck somewhere where you're you know in a really bad situation and some <laughs> some kind of divine help comes in <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah those two games uh, were extremely um you know lucky for me but overall i i did have a game against deepan which was a very good game 
um, and he was you know, he was really attacking, peace sacrifice, checkmate kind of stuff, and I defended and I and I won that game. And uh, yeah, overall a blast. I think Asian Juniors was it was a lot of fun. We had a great set of memories um, in that in that tournament, and uh, that's the reason I was able to play play very well. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you have won uh, so many tournaments uh, in the US or uh, overall in the world. Like, which uh, tournament win uh, do you think is so special to you? Well, the last one is very special. I won the Hastings, um, and that is very special. Even though, of course, it's not anything strong like it what it used to be, it's still a very prestigious <laughs> event. Yeah, to to even see that Alakine or like I, I believe Alakine won that uh, Alakine and Capablanca, right? I don't remember exactly, but along those lines um the top world champions or players like that who have won this tournament or played in this tournament and i actually won that at one one of the years was nice and also this was very special for me because i haven't had a win like this in a long long time i'm i'm usually this kind of a player i'm a very streaky player i just like win like unbelievable games and i lose unbelievable games <laughs> so but off late the losing has been happening a lot <laughs> and the and the winning hasn't been happening so i was uh, very worried for my own chess and i was struggling to keep the 2500 rating even now i'm like badly there because i'm teaching a lot more right yeah. but it was good this this tournament i spent a lot of time and um, i got some really great results and games and that was a big confidence booster uh, badalona is one of the places where i won a few um open tournaments there um i that's that was really good i tied for first in world open that has to be one of the big highlights <laughs> because i completed my uh, gm title there or my last norm and uh, i tied for first being an im which is very very rare these days world open there are lots of people winning it like eight people tied together or something like that <laughs> because it's a very strong event it's not easy to win it outright so i ended up tying for first place with camel mathon and uh, I lost the tie break to him but it was a very very you know nice memorable memorable event. Yeah. And one last thing I would I would remember as a very nice win was uh, actually there are two very strong wins one was the UTD Invitational Grandmaster tournament and uh, I lost my first game and I went like on a crazy spree I don't I don't know I scored like 9 out of 10 after that. Oh. in a close event <laughs> and then the same thing happened in Canada I scored like some 8 out of 9 in a close event. and i was just beating everyone so sometimes i feel like yeah i'm in a place i'm i'm doing that and sometimes i'm like the opposite the same utd tournament that i won um the either the previous year or the next year i scored like 2 and 1/2 out of 11 <laughs> so that's that's just me <laughs> yeah. and uh, one final question so you have uh, you have studied in utd dallas and how have you been you know um, focusing on chess as well as education how were you managing both simultaneously uh, luckily it was not too bad because um, i think i didn't have huge ambitions in terms of my academics uh, or education i was not striving to be an uh, all a student at all so that helps because again like i said you can achieve anything you want as long as you know what the balance is right yeah. so i did not spend hours and hours and hours saying uh, any days in every single class i just wanted to get a good grade and you know get a good education but Uh, but the thing is i i will not take much credit for what happened at ut dallas um for completing the title because i think probably the hours and um time that i spent before getting there probably sinked in and gave me more results than what i actually put in at that time um because i was in a new you know in a new college in new atmosphere i was not really studying chess that hard i was uh, there used there was a chess club that we would meet once a week and the, we had a great coach Rodney Milonovic was a coach and we had a good team so it was a nice chess environment we would play blitz we would study but it was not really that intense so i don't think i can take too much credit for that but um i mean it just again i was in the right place at the right time i had the right uh, my mind was in a good place and i had put in the work before so all of that came together for me when i was there and i was i was able to achieve that that result so i don't know if i can really uh, take much credit of for working during my tenure at ut dallas i was a very very again very laid back i wish i did a lot more during the time now <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, i would like to end this three i mean end the interview right here uh, although i wanted to ask a uh, lot more questions we don't have much time so i'll end here and i would like to ta- uh, thank you for uh, accepting to give the interview uh, the time went by so fast it was very quick uh, like 1 hour 40 minutes went by very quick and uh, again thank you for doing this And, oh yeah, yeah thank you thank thank you for inviting me it's fun um i'm nice to see your initiative yeah i would probably like to know more about how you got here but maybe you we someone else need to interview for that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> to 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 get that journey but uh yeah it's it's uh, glad glad to be here thanks for inviting me yeah and i would also like to wish you good luck uh, for proches academy and uh, and also your own academy and so on <laughs> thank you yeah it's a new new thing that we are all excited about it's me ramesh shurya we're all working on it and uh, our own academy my own academy is in uh, in us we have it both in new jersey and north carolina and it's uh, but right now all the tutoring is done online given the current, <laughs> current situation every everything is done online yeah thank you thank you and uh, i would also like to thank the audience for being patient and listening uh, carefully so thank you guys for watching and uh, Yeah see you see you